My name is Dave Ellis. I am the Chief of Police for the Spokane Valley Police Department. Thank you for coming to today's press conference regarding new legislative changes to take effect this Sunday, July 25th. The police chiefs and sheriffs here today, some who have traveled a long ways to attend, share concerns about these new laws and how they will impact the ability of officers and deputies to serve their communities. Spokane Police Chief Craig Meidel and Spokane Sheriff Ozzy Knizovic will cover some of these changes in a moment. But first, I'd like to recognize the police chiefs and sheriffs in attendance. Can I call your name if you please stand and acknowledge? Chief Brad Richmond, Every Heights Police Department. Chief Jay Day, Eastern Washington University Police Department. Chief Damon Simmons, Liberty Lake Police Department. Chief Kevin Fuhr, Moses Lake Police Department. Chief Gary Jenkins, Pullman Police Department. Chief Matt Murray, Yakima Police Department. Sheriff Dale Wagner, Adams County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Joe Helm, Columbia County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Raymond Maycumber, Perry County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Drew Heyer, Garfield County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Glenn Blakesley, Ponderay County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Brett Myers, Whitman County Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Mark Pryor, Walla Walla County Sheriff's Office. And joining us shortly will be uh, Chief John Hansley of the Cheney Police Department. I'd also like to thank the City of Spokane Valley and their staff for providing this facility for today's press, press conference and all their hard work in preparing it for this event. And now Chief Meidel will start today's presentation. Chief Meidel. Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for uh, being here. And I want to extend a, a special thank you to all the, the sheriffs and chiefs, uh, many who gave up their entire day to be here. Uh, the reason that we are all here is because we are very concerned about the impact of recent legislative reform laws that were passed and go into effect at 12.01 a.m. on Sunday. Uh, there is, uh, there will be some significant changes to what communities can expect to see from their law enforcement. Uh, there will be a change in the types of calls that we go to and the types of calls that we can no longer go to. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I can say when speaking for all of us is our number one priority is the safety of the community to continue to serve our communities with professionalism and do everything we can to keep the community safe. We are also law enforcement officers, which means when the law changes on what we can and can't do, we do have to follow that law. And you're, you're going to hear this afternoon uh, what some of those law changes are and what some of those impacts are as well. Um, I, I won't get into a whole lot of details now. I know the sheriff has a presentation, but um, I'm also hopeful that our uh, sheriffs and chiefs will, will be able to say a few words as well. It's, it's important for everyone to understand that you have, you have law enforcement leaders, all very, very intelligent people who are all looking at this and we are all extremely concerned about what's going to happen to not only our communities, but to the, to the states as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to the sheriff. Before I start, I need to do a disqualifier. Uh, my comments are not going to be reflective of everybody that sits up here. And we all have legal advisors. Our legal advisors are the ones that are telling us the parameters in which we can now respond. And it's really important for us to be able to follow that because we have to protect the men and women that are going to be responding as well as it protect the citizens that they're going to be responding to. Because these new law changes change some of the dynamic concerning who has uh, the authority to discipline law enforcement, who can be decertified for months on end, not terminated, decertified, meaning they can't do their job if they violate any of these particular laws or, quite frankly, any other law. This is a law that came into effect. I just got done talking to one of my deputies this morning about another matter, and she said, Sheriff, before I go, I, I, I have to. I have to talk to you. I said, okay, what's up? said, 
we are in chaos on the line level because of these new legislative laws. He said, you guys have done a good job trying to keep us prepped and informed, but we are in chaos. Well, quite frankly, the reason we're in chaos, the reason that no particular legal advisor in the state actually agrees with each other right now is that the legislature of the state of Washington chose to craft laws and did not invite their law enforcement leaders to the table to even discuss these issues. And now you hear from legislators that we are overreacting, that we don't understand the laws, that we don't understand their intent, and you're right, we don't. Neither do our legal advisors. There are some very, very smart people that sit up here. One's got a PhD that I know of. Chief Simmons. And I think he would agree that no, these, this is about as clear as mud. The legislatures decided to do this. They decided to and implement these changes. And the question that you all need to be asking is why? Even worse, they gave CJTC, the Training Commission, and the Attorney General's Office one year after implementation to develop the training, the policies and procedures concerning these new laws. They did it backwards, folks. If you're going to implement this type of reform, the first thing you do is develop the, the policies, develop your training, train your people to those policies, then implement the law. That's how it should have been done. But in their zeal to reform Washington, they did it backwards. And then they want to claim that we don't understand. Well, you're right. We don't. Nor do we understand the why behind all of these changes, other than the emotion behind certain high-profile instances involving police, which are the minority instances that happen in this community across the United States. We talk about science on almost every front there is. COVID, climate change. When are you, legislator, going to ask us about the science behind use of force and law enforcement? When do we have that discussion? Because if you would have asked that, had that discussion, you may have had a different view on your reforms. I'm not sure who's got the ability to change the PowerPoint. I don't see anything more. This is an, ex in, of an example of one of the subsections of these new laws that was driven purely by misinformation and emotion. Misinformation has been out there for at least six years. Uh, information that's been brought about by organizations like the ACLU in their 2000 15 report, War Comes Home, which portrays law enforcement officers as an occupying force and as having been militarized. So under 1040, this law prohibits law enforcement from accusation of military equipment. I don't know any chief that has an M16 uh, fully automatic, automatic rifle. Uh, most of those were converted down to standard semi-automatic weapons when they were given to us through the DRMO process it's because we didn't have that capability as having long rifles. 
They were all civilianized folks. Nor do I know of very many, if any, and, and to the legislators, please show me the example of an attack helicopter. Show me an example of an F-16. Any of you chiefs or sheriffs got F-16s in your back pocket? How about tanks? Because activists like to say that we have tanks. Show me one tank, please. They have messed this up to the point where they all thought we had 50 caliber machine guns. So they outlawed us having 50 caliber weapons. Well, here's a harsh reality. Because of a decision by the AG's office concerning this law, the state patrol was told you need to pull all of your shotguns offline. All your 12 gauge shotguns go offline. Your 40 millimeter launchers go offline. Your 37 millimeter launchers go offline. All because our legislature really thought we had 50 caliber machine guns. Now, this was the AG's office is WSP's legal advisor. They asked for that legal opinion. They got that legal opinion. Now, across the state of Washington, law enforcement agencies are pulling their shotguns, their 40 millimeter launchers and 37 meter, millimeter launchers offline. However, in, a, in a, another law, they say that we need to be able to have the capability to deliver less lethal munitions. It's mandated. Beam bags are actually mentioned in the law. How do I now use that capability of less lethal when you outlaw the delivery system? That is the question. What you have left us with is lethal means only. So you tell me we're confused. Your own AG said we needed to do this. The risk and danger to our, our citizens are immense just based on this one alone. And they did it because activists convinced them that we were militarized. Show me an example of any of those type of equipment in law enforcement. And quite frankly, shame on you, state reps and senators, for not demanding to show the proof. Show us the proof that this is going on. We respond to a lot of things. Another thing that activists have convinced our politicians concerning is that if we show up, we escalate things, which is not the case. The vast, vast, vast majority of times, the thousands of times, our men and women who wear these badges and serve you show up, we are a calming factor, we de-escalate issues, and de-escalation has been trained since I got into law enforcement 32 years ago. This is nothing new. SPD was one of the forerunners of CIT training in the nation, ladies and gentlemen, 2005. 2007, SPD and the Sheriff's Office led the nation in excited delir delirium training, curricular development and training. 2007, we have been de-escalating for a very long time. But activists and activist politicians want you, the citizens of our respective state, counties and cities to believe that all we do is go in and escalate. That is not the case. This is one potential fallout in reference to somebody that's having a true medical problem. Mental health is a medical problem that we may not be able to 
go to anymore. Our legal advisors are telling us this. As a matter of fact, if you read the last sentence, the last five words in that sentence, if there's not a crime there, you leave. For all the firefighters and EMS teams across the state of Washington, we apologize because you used to be able to stage out and wait for us to go in, calm things down, and then come in and do your duties. We really don't know if we can do that for you anymore. You may have to go into that situation and we show up once you have been assaulted. And if you don't think that that happens, my daughter was a paramedic for AMR in this community. Within two months of being in that position, she bought herself a bulletproof vest and said, thank God for deputies and police officers because they saved her life on multiple occasions. All because your legislators, some of your political activists and, and activist legislators want you to believe we are the bad guys. We are the ones that escalate. We don't use chokeholds. Never have. Not in this region. But the neck restraint, we did use. Why did this go away? It went away because people mistakenly believed that George Floyd had a chokehold placed on him. That was not a chokehold. That was a knee on a neck, and quite frankly, what happened to Mr. Floyd should not have happened. I don't think there's a professional on this dice would agree with you, or would agree with the fact that that was proper. That was improper. It shouldn't have happened. It was an incident, an isolated incident, but it was not a chokehold. No knock warrants. Do you know how hard it is to get a no knock warrant, especially in the state of Washington before this? The only reason for a no knock warrant was if we went in, we were pretty much guaranteed we were going to be faced with lethal force. We no longer can do that, and it has opened you, citizens, up to the potential of violence because we didn't have the ability to catch this person by surprise. But no knock warrants. How did we get here? Because somebody told you that something that happened 1,500 miles away from this community, officers went in and shot somebody based on a no knock warrant. Halfway true, they did have a no knock warrant. I said halfway true because those officers, after the investigation and everything came out, it was found that not only they did, did they knock, they did announce. You change law based on bad, false dialogue. And you've been doing it since Ferguson. Hands up, don't shoot, didn't happen, folks. Matter of fact, if you don't want to believe me, Google, hands up, don't shoot, didn't happen, Washington Post, and you will hear it straight from the reporter that started that monologue when he says, it didn't happen, I was wrong, and Michael Brown should not be a poster child for any movement. When and this is a challenge to the media. Are you going to start informing our public about the truth of what has happened? Because this false narrative drives these type of changes. The men and women of our state, the men sitting with us here today, have dedicated their lives to protection of this community. We have DV victims that we are extremely concerned about our ability to make sure that they are safe. 
The one thing I will assure the citizens of Spokane County in my closing remark is this. We have not abandoned you. We will not allow this law to make you unsafe because we will find a way to make sure that our response complies with the law and at the same time keeps you safe. But if you don't like what you're hearing today, there's one thing that the, those representatives and senators, senators told us uh, very loudly and clearly. You know, if the citizens don't like this, they can unelect us. Well, they told you what you need to do if you want to fix this. This is bad law based on junk science. You deserve better. Your law enforcement officers care deeply for you. They always have, they always will. And you never hear the thousands of times that we go in, calm things down and make things better. But you focus extreme points on the very rare times things go badly. If you look at the science, the science states this, excessive use of force in the United States happens at a statistical level that it can't really even be validated. That's what the science says. Legislator, if you don't like what I've said, too bad. You should have asked your experts. Some of us do have some knowledge. Thank you. Chief. Thank you, Sheriff, and I'll keep my comments short. I definitely would love to hear from, from some of the other chiefs and sheriffs as well. Uh, so some of the some of the nuances of these bills is, has created confusion. And I think that's why you'll see with some of our agencies, uh, we're close in a lot of areas, not exact in a lot of areas. And, and just to give you a couple examples, uh, when it comes to use of force, the nationwide standard has always been an officer may use reasonable force based on specific and articulable facts. The courts have said for decades that reasonable force cannot be boiled down to specific uh, direction in every single occasion because there's so many different variables. Uh, however, Washington State has restricted that to now officers and deputies may only use the least amount of physical force necessary to overcome resistance. So the least amount of physical force is, is somewhat of an uh, objective term. I'm going to give you a quick example of a call we went on uh, a couple weeks ago. A mental health individual in the street had a rock in his hand, clearly a danger to himself, clearly a danger to other people. Um, our officers knew that they could not leave because he was either going to get run over by a vehicle or he was going to use that rock against other folks that were, were outside this facility. So when an officer would go to contact this individual, he would take a bladed stance, ball his fist with a rock in his hand. So clearly pre-assaultive indicators, the officers know if they move in, they're going to be assaulted. So the officer could do an arm bar, a leg sweep, try a hair hold takedown, they could try a taser. So any one of those tools would potentially be reasonable, but which one is, is the least amount of physical force? I use that to illustrate, there's a lot of ambiguity with these laws that are exposing counties, municipalities, departments, and sheriff's office to tremendous amount of liability. Uh, one of the other things that is required, and, and you're, you're gonna see slower responses to some of our calls. Uh, we are sending more officers to more calls where, where we have a higher likelihood of, of some kind of resistance or violence occurring. Uh, that's also part of the bills is they require more resources to respond. That makes sense. It, it comes with a, a consequence of taking longer to get to some of these calls. One of the requirements of these bills as well is that officers must reposition as often as necessary to avoid using force. As often as necessary, is that two hours? Is that two days? Is that three weeks? So again, you have this very ambiguous phrase, as often as necessary, our officers and deputies need to reposition themselves to avoid using force. Under the, the current law, which changes this Sunday, the officers are required to use reasonable force in reasonable circumstances. Um, so you, you're gonna see a lot of these calls are just gonna take longer because the law now requires us to take as long as necessary to avoid the prospect of using force. Uh, officers are only authorized under House Bill 1310 to use force, in essence, under four prongs. To protect against criminal contact when an officer is making an arrest, to make an arrest, 
to prevent escape, and to prevent or to protect against an imminent threat of injury. So when officers respond to mental health calls, it is not illegal to have a mental health crisis. There's no crime. They may be committing other crimes, which is different, but many of the calls we go to, the person is just having a mental health crisis. If they are not uh, engaging in any of those prongs, officers are not allowed to use force to bring this person and get the help that they need. And we've all seen them on our streets. So officers will do their best, make their best efforts. There is a, a good faith effort to try to get this person help. But in the end, if this person refuses help and they're not breaking the law, which most of them are not, officers are not authorized under this bill to use force. We're hoping that's gonna change. We're hearing there's discussions that's going to change. But until that change occurs, uh, at least for the Spokane Police Department, uh, we're not going to be using force to take someone who's only having a mental health crisis into custody. Uh, it is contrary to the way the law is written and the law is very clear in this area. Um, also, officers must, a direct quote, exhaust available and appropriate de-escalation tactics. That exhaust ties in to take as long as necessary. We, we could literally probably spend weeks on one call and, and still not exhaust our, our efforts to try to gain compliance. An example we use if an officer is, if officers are engaging with someone for two hours and they finally determine we need to now take this person into custody, they're a danger to the community, they use force. Well, what's the counter the argument if you waited three hours instead of two? There's a, again, a tremendous amount of ambiguity. To be blunt, this, these laws are creating a lot of fear amongst law enforcement because they are very, very ambiguous. Uh, again, officers must take as much time as necessary before using force. Um, if there is no crime that is imminent, officers are required to leave the area. So we will continue to go on the vast majority of calls that we go on. Uh, and that falls under the umbrella that we've all taken an oath to keep our communities safe. However, if there is no imminent threat of a crime occurring, officers are required to leave the area. And, and you saw that on the sheriff's PowerPoint. We have to leave the area. And it's not that we want to, because we truly believe, based on our experience of thousands and thousands of calls, we go on over 100,000 incidents every year. Almost without exception, the presence of law enforcement calms things down. Uh, our officers become very, very good at de-escalating. However, if even when tensions are high, if there's no crime and it doesn't appear that there's going to be any kind of assault or crime, officers are required to leave the area. Um, I'll say one last thing and then I would um, definitely love to hear from some of our other sheriffs and police chiefs. The threshold with which force can be used uh, is now probable cause. Uh, the law in the rest of the nation is, is, uh, falls under a uh, Terry stop. So if it, when we respond to calls, many of our calls are in progress. As we're arriving, it's not uncommon that the suspect or suspects are fleeing the area because the police are arriving on scene. Effective this Sunday, officers need probable cause to use force to detain that person. We can still ask for voluntary compliance. Uh, my sense is, is once, the, once the community understands that we can't use force under reasonable suspicion to keep someone from leaving while we continue the investigation, we're gonna see a lot more people fleeing the area. We are not allowed by law to use force unless we have probable cause. So what that means in layman's terms is officers have to be able to conduct an investigation to develop probable cause to be able to stop that person from fleeing. If they, if they aren't able to develop that probable cause within the first couple of minutes, that person is going to be long gone. And that means that in many, many situations, we're not going to know who the suspect is. The assault calls, the burglary calls, the robbery calls, uh, part of the, the rest of the, the nation and the judges have understood. We understand that people are going to flee. You need to use reasonable force to keep them from leaving while you finish the investigation. That doesn't mean anyone who's fleeing can have force used against them. You have to have reasonable and articulable suspicion that this person was involved. Um, and unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of criminals that are going to be able to flee because we haven't been able to conduct that investigation yet because we're still arriving on scene. That's going to be huge for, for our inability to capture people who are actually engaging the crimes. For those that we do know that flee before we can develop probable cause, we will request warrants for them or summons for them. Uh, that can usually take several weeks before that makes it through the system as well. So on top of us not being able to, uh, to apprehend people at the time they're committing the crime, uh, it's important for the community to understand that we are going to be uh, taking longer to get to their, their calls. We're going to get there as quickly as we can, but as law enforcement officers, we have to follow the law. And we're going to do everything we can to keep the community safe within the new parameters of these laws. And with that, I'd like to open up to any other chiefs or sheriffs.
I'd like to piggyback on what Chief Meidel said, and that is, is in the city of Moses Lake, um, we have a clearance rate, meaning we solve uh, crime at about 50%, uh, which is fairly high. And we, and we do that because our officers are quick to the scene. Um, if somebody is on the scene that is a suspect, they can uh, detain them and get the, get the information while other officers are, are um, investigating the case, and we usually put somebody in custody. We have a fair amount of gang violence in Moses Lake, um, and we're able to solve um, um, a lot of those cases because of our quick action. Um, with losing a reasonable suspicion and having to have probable cause, um, we are going to see our gang members, um, when they're involved in gang violence, more than likely, uh, as the Chief Meidel said, flee. It's not gonna give us the opportunity to, or the ability, um, the legal authority to stop them and detain them um, and figure out what's going on. I fear our clearance rate is going to drop um, significantly. And an unintended consequence of this is that um, it's going to force officers to do uh, longer investigations, which means it's going to take more officers off the streets because they're going to have to do follow-up, uh, completing these investigations, gaining the search warrants, uh, arrest warrants, whatever they need, uh, to be able to clear those out when, when currently uh, we could probably clear a case out in a night or two. Uh, this. Uh, Legislation may take us uh, days, weeks, or even months to complete. And so, uh, again, I fear that our clearance rate will drop because of that. Um, we will, in Moses Lake, continue to make sure that we serve our community per our mission statement. Uh, professionally, we will do everything in our power to make sure that our citizens are safe, and we will take care of them and our, and our staff and our officers. Uh, but obviously, uh, with some of this legislation, we are a little handcuffed, and so thank you. So I appreciate the opportunity that we were given from uh, the Spokane County and Spokane Police Departments for the opportunity to come here and have this kind of an outlet uh, with the media, and I appreciate the media for being here as well. My name is Sheriff Wagner with Adams County Sheriff's Office. I'm one of the larger uh, by area counties in the state with uh, a lot of miles and not a lot of resources. And this legislation didn't take any of that into account. We have 16 active deputies on the road that sometimes work long hours alone, dealing with a lot of issues that are nationally recognized, such as homicides that have happened at the beginning of this year, um, that were all over the nation in news. Some of the issues that we face each year are basically handled by one or two deputies at a time. We're a small agency, and if you look at this group of uh, individuals here, some of us are small, some of us are very large. We don't have the outlet in the media, we don't have the things that some of these larger agencies have, including five people to show up to a call. Some of our calls happen rapidly for us. The, the time it takes to get to a call could be several minutes, half hour, hour, and we're out there by ourselves a lot. Some of the things we deal with and we're hearing from our communities is uh, the ambulance crews saying, what are we gonna do when we have to go into this certain area? The fire departments are dealing with the same uh, concerns. The biggest ones are the mental health uh, people. We don't have all these teams of people to assist in all these things. So as the sheriff's office, who is our protectors in our communities in Adams County and the, the local law enforcement in that county, we rely on each other a lot. And this kind of wipes away a lot of that for us. Our fire chiefs and our our medical and our and our mental health are saying we can't go there alone they're only one person unfortunately our hands are being tied and we're having to deal with these things in a in a manner that's a lot different than even the bigger cities so some of this legislation that you're seeing is not taking into account the smaller agencies that have to deal with a large capacity we don't have the resources and so I would hope that you all consider those things and talk to your legislatures and get, get them to understand that this isn't just one false swoop that we all fall under. Law enforcement is under attack and it will probably continue to be under attack until we start taking a stand and making sure that we understand these laws and the rules that we have 
to, to govern ourselves as a community, as law enforcement. In Adams County, I'm going to be honest with you, we are going to serve our community. We're going to do whatever we can. And we're going to take the steps necessary to follow the law as best as possible, but the, the public needs to know this is very binding. I thank you for your time. Thank you for, for the opportunity to speak. Well, I'm pretty sure you, any one of us could probably tie up the next 30 minutes if we wanted to. Um, but there's there's one thing that I want to uh, kind of bring in uh, that I haven't heard talked about a lot today, and that's going to be the uh, the demoralization, uh, demoralization of our of our deputies or our peace officers. This isn't what they signed up for. Um, a lot of them on the front line are telling me this is an attack on the identity of a peace officer. I can say that some of my uh, some of my best memories over the last 20 plus years have been when I didn't throw someone in jail, when I was able to find that solution to get someone some help. Those solutions are being taken away from us. Um, as my anecdote, we recently had a, a gentleman that we found uh, on a silver alert and under the use of force restrictions of 1310, um, it was a it was a, a nightmare that would have happened after the 25th because um, we wouldn't have been able to use force to 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 detain him long enough to get him some help to get his family to come get him again and in 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 my community in Ferry County generally the first call is out to the sheriff's office to figure out what can be done about a situation. Often we show up at uh, medical calls even before the EMS uh, units do. And it's not even clear how much help we can give before other units arrive. So I just uh, encourage the public to uh, look, at, look at their legislators, look to see who voted for this. And maybe the legislators would talk to their constituents and explain it to them because they're not doing a good job of explaining it to us. Thank you. Any other sheriff or chief wish to speak? If not, I'm just going to mention one thing that Chief Vital mentioned. Investigations. The most critical aspect of an investigation are the critical moments right after the crime happens. If you do not collect the proper information, you do not collect the proper witness information, you do not get information concerning the suspect, you don't have the ability to go back and recreate that often. You lose that precious evidence, which means the victim of those crimes lose their opportunity for justice. Since 2004, the Sheriff's Office has not had an unsolved homicide because of our abilities and the abilities of our people to go out and rapidly collect information, identify suspect information. Your senators, your representatives, who voted for these measures put all of that at risk with this legislation. <coughs> More importantly, if it wasn't their intent, they should have done this better, as I said before. Develop your policies, develop your training, train us, then implement your reforms. We'll open up for questions. Any questions? My question is for our uh, new sheriff and also chief. Uh, there are some lawsuits against these new laws. Will Spoken County be also filing and joining them? I, I, we have joined or are about to join one lawsuit in reference to one of these uh, laws pertaining to uh, 1052, uh, which states that the sheriff, who is, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, and no offense to my chief's friends in this room, 
is the chief executive officer of the county and conservator of the peace in the county. I stress that because your cities are in counties. The legislature, the state constitution puts great weight on our ability to do our jobs. Quite frankly, if a jurisdiction chooses not to investigate certain crimes and we know about it, sheriffs are mandated by law to go and fix the problem and investigate the crimes. Much of this law that you see that has changed was King Countyized, Seattleized, because they hate law enforcement over there apparently. They don't trust their law enforcement. They took, they gave nine city blocks last summer away to terrorists. Well, that particular law that they changed now states that a, a sheriff that's not part of a charter county has to ask the Board of County Commissioners chair to use gas in a riot. It's contrary to law. I have the ability to call all forces necessary to put down any riot insurrection in this county, regardless of what jurisdiction that happens in. And I intend to do so. So we will be joining that lawsuit. We are looking at other injunctions to file in reference to this, mainly the loss of our 12 gauge shotguns, which means we lost our less lethal capability. That is a danger to the community. We want to be able to use less lethal. You left us with no options but lethal. I hope that answers your question. Uh, kind of speaking to the room, uh, having legal assistance on standby, is that is that something that you guys expect to have handy as far as when officers, when deputies respond to different crimes? So well, what can we do? I mean, it sounds like it's all still up for interpretation. So is that is that maybe a strategy or of how to mud your way through, through these new laws moving forward? It really doesn't work at Dark 30. Oh, dark 30, a lot of bad things can happen. There's no legal advisor in their pockets. And quite frankly, as some of these sheriffs mentioned, even as larger county sheriffs, if I have a problem down in Leyta, I know that my backup is 30 minutes away. And I'm not going to have time to get on the phone and go, um, Larry, can I do this? And I'll, and I'll answer that as well. So we're, we're trying to get ahead of that right now. Um, our legal advisors, I think, are struggling as well because there are many, many definitions that are not in, uh, basically defined within the bill. An example is, um, you, can, you know, take as much time as necessary before using force. Necessary, we're not sure what that means in our legal can't tell us because it's not defined. Uh, use the minimal amount of force necessary. What is the minimal amount of force necessary? It, it, there's so many variables based on the size of the officer, size of the suspects, is the officer outnumbered? Um, are two things equal? So we typically have a, a compliance, and we have a mid-force levels, and then obviously deadly force levels. That's typically, and I, I'm somewhat oversimplifying that, how we define force. And, and we're not sure if that means different levels of force are gonna fit within there or not. So as we try to get ahead of this by, by talking with our legal advisors, at least for Kansas City, they're struggling for the same reasons we are, just because there's just not a lot of definitions for some of these vague terms. Right. And, 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 and folks, before we answer, if you're going to answer, I suggest coming up because they're not probably able to pick a lot of your answers up. So um, come on up uh, to the mic uh, so that they can catch your answer. I think another thing you need to know is we all are in very unique situations. In Yakima, we have a city jail and we have patrol. And the state legislature defined use of force different for a corrections officer than they did for a street officer. So we only have two people in the jail at night. If something happens, they call the police for help. Well, can we go in? If it's only a mental situation, can we even help our own corrections officers? Um, so there's no lawyer out there who can say, oh yeah, this is what they meant, because I don't think they thought about that. And one of the things I think all of us can tell you is there's a lot of unknowns that are going to come. There's situations in our, you probably have 
no offense, gentlemen, several hundred years of law enforcement experience. And if we all sat around and roundtabled some of the scenarios that we're talking about, we would come to different conclusions. I often say that the Supreme Court has nine of the top judges in the country, and they don't come to the same conclusion. So when people say, oh, this is what the law means, well, that's their opinion. And I think we're all going to struggle until there's case law, until they change the law, until there's definitions. All of us are going to do the best we can to try to uh, determine what that means, and it may look different in different communities. The one thing I would say is the fact that we're all here together should tell you something. You know, all of us are struggling with the same thing. Nobody just woke up and said, well, we're just mad at the legislature, so we're going we're gonna to do this, you know, take our ball and go home, I think one of them said. That is not the case. We are truly fearful. We truly want to do a good job. And I think we, we are showing you through, through our solidarity here that we may not all agree on the finer points, but we're all concerned and we definitely want the community to know that we care. We're going to do our best, but, but this is law. This is not an opinion. Oh, there was a question okay. over right. here. There was a question over here. <laughs> yeah, Director Nesovich, um, where are you hearing that you guys were not consulted in case of these laws? Because we are hearing that some uh, officers across the state consulted and helped change the law. Uh, that comes from our WASPIC representatives that basically said, this is happening, there's nothing we're going to be able to do to change it. Those are quotes. And you may have had some when you define the sum, they work for a state agency called CJTC, most likely, and that's after the fact. So we, we weren't. I can tell you that in the last 15 years, my legislators call me when they're crafting laws, getting ready, especially if it affects law enforcement. I received zero calls from three of my legislators that one of whom actually signed on to these laws. They didn't contact us. Now, other legislators in this area were calling me on a constant basis going, oh my goodness, this is about ready to happen and we can't stop it. So there was one, one time that we reached out and the only reason we are we preserved the ability of the state of Washington to have military armored vehicles, not armed, none of them were ever armed, armored vehicles is because Senator Billig did help us in that arena preserve that capability. But that was it. Period. We very, very crystal clear to us. And quite frankly, this is probably six months too late. When we knew that our legislature had basically frozen us out, we should have been standing on the steps of the Capitol going, uh, you want our input? That's when we should have had that, this meeting then. I'm wondering what would you say to the other side, some of those groups that maybe think that these laws, these, these new laws are absolutely necessary. We can open this up to the group. I guess what would you say to them? I think I already answered that question. Show me the, the science behind your claim. I'll show you the science. I, I'm very confident in it. At any minute, I will show you the science. They have failed. Matter of fact, when asked about that, during those conversations, they didn't want to hear it. And here's the worst part about the way the legislator, le legislature went down this year. It was all Zoom. It's pretty easy to freeze people out of meetings, doing Zoom meetings, folks. And that's pretty much what happened. I Very difficult to freeze somebody out when they're all sitting in front of you, staring at you. So my, my comment back, just like with the military equipment, show me the F-16 that any law enforcement agency had that you thought you really had to do this law change, to even enumerate that in law. Please show it to me. All right, last question, because we've had you here a long time and some of these folks are a long way to drive. I was hoping maybe you could help us better explain, understand uh, how your interpretation is with, with use of force and the use of um, uh, tear gas. How, after Sunday, what 
what that would look like? I'll give you my interpretation, then I'll open it up to any sheriff or chief that wants to uh, tag on that. Um, come Sunday, we don't have the capability of delivering tear gas. I hope you understand that. They took that away. That means that hostage situation that we had a few nights ago where we were figuring out how to get that and it resolved peacefully, folks, because that's what we do 99% of the time. If that had got escalated, we would have had the capability of putting gas rounds into the house using 40 millimeter, 37 millimeter capabilities or shotguns. Now, if that happens, come midnight, the 25th, a SWAT operator will have to go up, break the window, and insert it by hand. Very much more dangerous. Very much more likely for a lethal encounter. But they took away our ability to deliver gas, munitions, and Again, if you think that we misinterpreted that law, well, your own AG's office said that's what needed to happen. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. Thank you, chiefs and sheriffs, for taking the time to come up. If anybody else has any closing remarks, feel free. Going once, going twice. Thank you very much.